we lift our hands here. Let us praise Jesus now. We are standing in His presence on holy ground. Let's sing that one more time. Come on now. Oh, we are be seated or not. Nope, 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 nope. Just stand. Let's keep on standing. No, be seated. No, just keep on standing. And Joe, come let's do this first and last verse of leaning on the everlasting arms. How many are glad he's a rock we can lean on and our times of trouble? What a fellowship. Let's sing it tonight. Leaning on the everlasting What a fellowship. What a joy divine. may be seated tonight. We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that are in person with us tonight, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Good to be in the house of God. And those that are joining us through the live streaming, those who will download the program sometime from Sunday to Sunday, thousands of people come by and view the service and we thank you so very much for doing that. I'll tell you, I have missed our choir and the Lord willing, right after Easter, we're going back to our choir. We're going to go back to Sunday school and, and uh, do our best to have some sense of normalcy. But Brother Tom, I've said this to you privately. Come here, son. I want you to know that your pastor appreciates you going beyond and above, making sure that we had some good music, even though we couldn't have the choir. And I appreciate his helpers, and uh, thank you so very much. Uh, about four weeks into that pandemic, we wasn't doing youth groups or we wasn't uh, doing the choir. Tom said, man, I'm not earning my keep. I said, we got Beth to play the piano, so that'd be good, but I want you to give him a hand. Let him know you thank him, working hard for that. So uh, come on, ensemble, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting our choir back, but I'm, boy, did they not sing this morning about the anchor. Glory to God, children. I had a time with that. And they're going to sing a song tonight. We've got special, special singers tonight. Uh, uh, Rain up, stand up over there and hold up that. Look at that. That's Brother Barros' granddaughter. And look at all that hair on that baby's head. Hey, honey, who's your favorite preacher? I believe I heard her say, Brother Joe. I really do believe I heard. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Well, isn't it good tonight to be in the house of the Lord? Uh, Miss Richter, good to see you. Tell James we love him. Thank you for being in our service tonight. All right? All right, come on, sing for us. Hallelujah. Well, they sent 
for Jesus. Your friend's about to die. Yeah, tell me he's still for a while. So they lay Lazarus in that old tomb. And then they said their last goodbyes. They're coming down the road with Jesus right on time. Just hold on, my child, because he's not so far away. And he knows your need before you deserts and they were so hot and dry until it seemed the hope was gone and I would die and then I've wondered where was he and is he still a friend of mine then coming down the road was Jesus right on just hold on, my child, because he's not so far away. And he knows your need before he prays. So when your feet are weary from the mountains you have climbed, look ahead, here comes Jesus right on time. Aren't you glad that God is an on-time God? I'm so thankful for that as well. We're going to go ahead and make a few announcements. Don't forget, and Brother Joe's wanted me to mention and wants you to as well, our Easter service, that we do have a special guest that's going to be with us, and you make sure you come out and be a part of that service with us as well. And it's always a good time to, to have these great things. Make sure that you remember also the baby shower that we're going to be having uh, the 28th, 3 o'clock, and a uh, great way to grow the church. We're thankful for that, and uh, we appreciate these young families and uh, continue to help them through these times that they're crazy uh, in these times. You imagine trying to have your children and bringing those children up during the times that we are in right now. And uh, I'm thankful that my children are on the, the upswing of this. But you pray for those young people as well. Then the gap as, as well on the April the 11th is going to be doing the snack Sunday night after church. So you make sure that they're going to be a part of that and you be a part of it. And then our Harvest Bible School is going to be having some new classes starting on April the 1st. Make sure that you do that. Uh, if you would like to be a part of that, continue with that. We do have some new material that is in our book store. The bookstore is going, and uh, some good CDs, another good uh, book here by Brother Treber, Hope in Troubled Times, so that'd be a help to you, and encouragement as well, and I'm uh, so thankful that we have opportunity here, so go buy that bookstore and spend some time there. Thank you. Are you glad the Lord died for you on the cross? And you know why he did that, don't you? Because he loved me. How many has ever heard of Tony Orlando and Dawn? Or Jimmy Swaggart and the Singers, or, or uh, the Rattlesnake guy, Wendy Bag on the Sunlighters. 
this is are the, the this are the three J's. My wife Julie, my daughter Joanna, and uh, we're gonna do an old primitive quartet song. And aren't you glad because he loved us, man? We love him. We're gonna sing a little bit tonight. I'll tell you, I'm so excited about church. Man, you'd think after all these years I'd calm down. I think the further I go with God, the more I get stirred up. God is good because, because he loved me. On a hill called Calvary, Jesus my Lord suffered for me. Carried the cross all the way, my sins to atone, my sins to atone. Then they nailed him to the cross, great was the pain and the loss. He suffered it all, he suffered it all, because he loved me, because he loved me. Because he loved me, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, he loves me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all. Suffered it all because he loved me, because he loved me. Then they carried him away, placed him in a lowly grave. Surely they thought that this would be the end of this man. The end of this man On that third and glorious day God came and rolled the stone away He rose from the dead He rose from the dead Because he loved me Because he loved me Because he loved me My Savior died On the cross was crucified no greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Has ever been known. Oh, gracious dear name, he loves me so. Now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all, he suffered it all because he loved me. Sing it, brother, so that chorus. Because he loved me. My Savior died On the cross Was crucified No greater love By mortal man Has ever been known Has ever been known Oh gracious dear name He loves me so Now I am his He's mine I know He suffered it all He suffered it all because he loved me, because he loved me, he suffered in vain. So now I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all, he suffered it all. Because he loved me, because he loved me. I think I changed something on them, but... You did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Why don't you just shut up, Tom? One of these... One of these days, Brother Vanderwall, they're going to get old like us. And you're going to learn it ain't good to make fun of old people, amen. I was preaching in Burnsville, North Carolina. And on a Tuesday morning, early, I got this call from 
Tom, he's frantic. He said, Brother Joe, it's bad. He said, Matt Everett has been in a terrible automobile accident and he's hurt bad. And they've got him downtown and at the Grady Trauma Center and they won't even let his wife, Christy, in there to see him. That lady met her at the door and said, if he comes down to expire, we'll call you. And buddy, God's people began to pray. We didn't know if he'd walk again. We didn't know if he'd live again. We didn't know if he'd ever sing again. So tonight, I want to introduce to you again another walking, talking miracle. Come on, Matt. Yeah, sing and give God the glory. I can tell you I'm nothing, and I will be telling the truth. I can say I am a worthless, a hopeless sinner, that's true, but that's just part of the story I haven't told everything, for I was lost, pre-born. Well, 
dog, I'm glad God answers prayer. God answers prayer. And I'm glad Matt's on his way to recovery. That's wonderful, isn't it? God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I was 4.30 this morning. I was trying not to wake up my wife, but man, God was meeting with me and I was meeting with God and we was having a time and that sermon this morning was just like burning in my heart and I got to think about all those men in the land of Babylon bound down to idols and bound down to earthly king and brother Don come on up here I want you to get with your family and, and I got to think about that song he sings how great it is to serve a living God I'm glad tonight he's not dead He's not sick. He's not a figment of our imagination. Simon Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of his majesty. But we was on the holy mountain and we heard the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. And aren't you glad our God sees us? Our God knows us? Our God hears us. Our God touches us. Mm. And I'm glad he is a living God. The son of the living God. And Jesus is his name. Hallelujah, what a savior. And so Brother Don just sang a far out of it. And I appreciate it tonight. Brother Moore, get ready. Come up, greet our people, and we'll get you ready to go. Man, it's just good to be in the house of the Lord. Turn somebody and say, ooh, I love you, and so does Jesus. Amen. Glory. I listened as a man who cried out to his gods of wood and stone. And it broke my heart to see all the tears he shed alone For I knew That it was hopeless And he would not receive An answer from The gods that he served Who cannot hear nor see So I fell down on my knees to pray like so many times before and I boldly asked my God to hear my prayer once more and it seemed the heavens just opened up oh and I can hear him say why yes my child I can hear you what do you need today? How great it is to serve a living God Who knows each breath I take and every step I try If it gets much better, we're going to have to have a glorified body. God is good. Brother Gary, I want you to come, and I won't ever forget when he came to my office to tell me about the vision God had given him about that Mercies Project, and uh, we, our church was on board with that, and then we took up a, uh, several years ago a very large, large sum of money and gave, and then when Barry came, we talked about Brother Cron, and I said, Barry, you ever heard of the Mercies Project? 
He said, Brother Joe, I've been keeping up with that all these years when we lived in Florida. And little did we know that Brother Barry would have such a wonderful part of that. But I, I appreciate it. And he pastors the Nottingham Missionary Baptist Church in Nottingham, Pennsylvania, about one block from the Hers Tater Chip Factory. And I've been preaching up there for you since 1997. My kids were just little. And he's from Atlanta, but he's been up there, what, 30 years near? 27 years. His daddy's uh, Talbot Moore with GPA. His uncle's uh, uh, Preston Moore and Jim Moore. And they're just, our, our area is blessed with the Moore family. And when I came to Atlanta, your family took me in, brother, and was kind to me. And we love this man for his burden for missions, but I love him because he loves the Word of God. And I want you to get your Bible tonight and listen to what this man's got to say. And I want you to welcome Dr. Gary Moore to the Tabernacle Pulpit tonight. God bless you, Brother Gary. If you walk around, just take that with you. You'll be fine. Right. Amen. It ain't great to be saved and on your way to glory. Amen. I'm happy to be a part of the family of God. Uh, and if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn with me. Uh, I'm going to make a couple of comments, but we're going to be in the book of 2 Peter, uh, chapter number 1, 2 Peter, chapter number 1. And we're actually going to start reading in verse 1 and read a few verses there in just a minute, and we'll bring a message that the Lord's laid on our heart for tonight. I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Uh, but I'll give you just a little bit of an update. And uh, uh, Brother uh, Barry and I actually uh, were talking about this just this past week. Uh, so the plans for uh, Mercy's Vessel uh, is to leave uh, Gulfport somewhere uh, right after the 4th of July and we're going to spend about a month in New Orleans and uh, we're going to be doing work uh, with the Terrytown ba uh, Family Baptist Church uh, where uh, Brother uh, Rogers is the pastor there and a uh, missionary, actually a missionary pastor uh, and then if the Lord uh, wills and everything works out when we leave there instead of going back to Gulfport uh, we will have been away about six or seven weeks by then away from Gulfport but then we're going to go on down uh, to uh, southern Texas and spend about three weeks of ministry down there uh, and bring us uh, somewhere to around the middle of September before we get back. We do want to get back to Gulfport before October, and if you don't, uh, if you don't know why, uh, then you've never been on a boat in October in a hurricane. And uh, and we've done that. We have been on a boat in October in a hurricane, uh, and uh, and Barry was on it the last time. It was in a hurricane, and so uh, uh, we, we'd rather not do that again. Uh, and so we want to get the we want to get her safely ported and tied up, good and secure, uh, and uh, before uh, the worst part of the hurricane season uh, comes. Uh, but then, uh, Lord willing, next year we'll be able to start making some international trips. We've been we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for an opportunity to get to go back. Uh, to Puerto Cortez uh, in Honduras. We had a, a medical mission there, uh, not this last November, but the one before. Uh, and I don't even know exactly how many were saved. I know there's about 20 adults saved, but we had so many young people coming through Bible school, we couldn't even really keep count. Uh, but we saw 2,500 patients in the clinic uh, in a week's time. Uh, and uh, we distributed thousands of prescriptions uh, and we did dental work we had uh, we had dentists we had doctors uh, and we had physical therapists and so uh, we had a huge clinic there and uh, they've been wanting us to come back ever since we were supposed to go back last November but the pandemic kept us from doing that uh, and so we're just really praying that the Lord will open that door back up uh, and we'll be able to go back down there with the ship this time uh, and uh, uh, and there's just so many benefits to being able to use the ship and we're seeing that more and more uh, the one good thing we did learn this time is we learned that Mercy's vessel performs well under pressure uh, we had uh, we got to the port and we had to run our generators for electricity uh, because of uh, because we weren't compatible with their electric uh, with their shore power uh, so we ran the uh, generators but everything worked great we didn't have a problem with it uh, we had about 17 sleeping on 
on board the ship. On Friday night, we fed 35 on the ship. Uh, and on Sunday, we made meals for over 200 uh, on the ship and then took them uh, to the location where we were uh, reaching out to the homeless and to the church population that day. And it all went very, very, very well. We had uh, one very, very, very tired cook that we took home to, uh, to uh, uh, back to Nottingham after it was over. Uh, and uh, Emma, uh, I tell you, that girl would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, and get all the lunches prepared first and then prepare uh, breakfast uh, for the crew and for the team. Uh, and then as soon as we were all gone, she started pre uh, preparing the evening meal. And she did this over and over and over. And uh, we got in the car to go back to Nottingham. Uh, and uh, she got in the back seat and I think she woke up somewhere about 20 minutes before we got home so uh, so Emma earned her keep on this trip but uh, isn't it great she's only 16 years old isn't it great to have young people willing to just give their time and effort to the she's only 16 years old and she can, and she can cook oh my goodness yeah feed 200 at a time <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, okay, so she, she's not available for about four or five years, guys, okay, so if she comes down here when we're planning another mission trip, just want you to know, as pretty as she is and as good she can cook, her daddy is not going to let her out of his sight for several years, so you just go ahead and count on that. All right, if you found, by the way, I just got to say a, a, a little word, I'll Try not to reminisce too much. But I do remember the very first time that uh, Joe came up to preach for us at Nottingham, way back in the dark ages, and uh, back in the last century. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we said to him, we said, why don't you bring your wife? And he said, oh, well, that's okay. Uh, he said, uh, but then he got up there, and about the second day up there, he said, you know what, I, I think I would like for my wife and my uh, family to come up here. So we, we brought them up. And they spent the last half of the week with us. Uh, and man, I'll tell you, I'm just, uh, I, it, it's hard to take in, isn't it? That little seven-year-old girl that was riding around in the church van with us, uh, now she's a lawyer and she's running the whole show. Is that right? Yeah. She, I know she's in charge. I heard it up here. I, amen? Yeah. I know, hey, I know, I've been pastor in Nottingham for 27 years. You know what that say? If you want to know something, you go straight to the horse's mouth. You ask the pastor's wife. That's what you do. All right, if you found uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1, if you'd stand with us, please, in honor of the reading of the Word of God, we'll bring the message the Lord has uh, on our heart tonight. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now notice this. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance uh, uh, and to temperance and, uh, and to uh, uh, I'll back up and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, now notice that, look at verse 9 again, he that lacketh these things blind cannot see afar off, forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Didn't say that he wasn't purged, said he forgot that he was purged. And then in verse 10 he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, 
In other words, don't do verse 9, do verse 10. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an inheritance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, for just a few moments, we pray you'd help us as we look into the word of God. Speak to us through the pages of eternal truth uh, and help us in our daily living. And dear God of glory, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for all you do among us. For we make our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Now I want you to notice just a couple of things by way of introduction. We're, we're going to center our attention on the latter part of this passage of Scripture, but I do want you to notice something uh, a little bit about the opening verses that we read. And one of the things I want you to notice is he says you need to have certain things in your life. It is imperative as Christians that we have certain aspects of God's nature in our life. You say, well, you don't truly mean that. Well, I Absolutely, I mean that. They told me to uh, grab a hold of this if I was going to get away, so I forgot. But anyway, if absolutely, I mean that because this is what he says. He says, by this, ye are partakers of the divine nature. I'm telling you that the power of God indwells the believer. The nature of holiness and the nature of divinity lives within the life uh, and the experience of the believer. And he says if you'll place certain things in your life, you won't be barren and unfruitful. Now notice what these things are. He said give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, temperance patience, patience godliness, godless brotherliness, godliness brotherly kindness, and a brotherly kindness charity. Add these things into your life. Now I want you to notice something. He tells us in this passage not to forget that we were purged from our old sins. It's not, it's not good for a Christian to forget where God brought you from. You got to remember that. You, hey, if you get all high and mighty in the place where you're too good to sin and where you can't fall and where you can't stumble, the Bible says take heed when you get to that place because you're about to fall. You're about to stumble. And, and, the, uh, and the, the problem with a lot of Christians is is they forgot that they were w wicked, filthy, low down, good for nothing, hell bound sinners. But after you get saved, you don't just stop there. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that we need to go on. We need to pass these principles uh, of salvation. Then we need to go on and we need to add these things into our Christian life. And when we begin to build these things in our Christian life, then we begin to be useful in the kingdom of God. We begin to be useful in the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to add all these things in. He says, wherefore, the rather, verse number 10, brethren, give diligence. Give diligence. Now, he already used that word once. Now, by the way, when you're reading the Bible or studying the scriptures, it's always a real good idea if a word uh, appears more than once, especially in a chapter or in a passage of scripture, it's a good idea to take note of that word. And he uses the word diligence twice here. By the way, he uses the word precious a couple of times in this passage of Scripture too. And, and it's a, uh, not long ago we did a study on the words that appeared more than once uh, in the first chapter of the book of Second, uh, of Second Peter. And I'll tell you, every one of those words that appears over and over again, there's something wonderful about it. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, there's something glorious about those promises. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. But anyway, I've got I to gotta move on. But I want you to notice, he, t he tells us this. Let's go back to verse 1. He says, Simon Peter, servant apostle of uh, Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained what? Like precious faith. So we have precious faith and we have precious promises. With us through the righteousness of God uh, and our Savior Jesus Christ, uh, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. And then he says, according to his divine power hath given unto us all things... Off everything you need. Let me tell you something. Everything you need to uh, live the Christian life, God's already given it to you. You may not be using it. You may not be applying it. But if you've got a Bible uh, and you've got the Holy Ghost uh, and you're willing to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit as he guides you in your Christian life and you've got the encouragement of brothers and sisters who are born again with you, my friend, you've got 
what you need for the Christian life. It's not a program. It's not a plan. Uh, it's not a. It's not a twelve step or anything else. You've got what you need to live the Christian life. It's there. It's there for you. The problem is not that you don't have it. It's the problem is is you don't use it. Amen. You don't use it. And he says this. He says in verse five. And besides this, giving all diligence add to your faith. And we've read that a couple of times already. Giving all diligence. Uh, I moved to Texas uh, way back 100 years ago. No, it couldn't be that long because my wife's way, way too young for that. Uh, but anyway, I moved, moved to Texas uh, a long time ago to help with a church, and I met a girl out there, and her name was Helen, uh, and I gave all diligence to making her my wife. <laughs> Amen? Amen. The, the phrase giving all diligence the concept there is to be totally consumed with it to be totally consumed with it and so what does Peter say Peter says you need to be totally consumed with building your relationship with Christ and adding these things in your Christian experience you need to be totally wrapped up in that Amen? So we're giving all diligence. Now notice what he says uh, just a little bit down uh, further. He says, uh, in verse number uh, 8, he says, If these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now a lot of people have the idea that barren and unfruitful are the same words. I'm not, I have the Greek words here, but I'm not going to mention them because that's not the important thing. The important thing is, is that barren and unfruitful, as is used in this passage, are not the same word. Uh, the word barren here means, I'm just going to tell you exactly what it really means. The word barren means lazy. That's what it means. And then the word unfruitful means what you think barren means, and that means producing, uh, causing no product, producing no fruit, giving nothing uh, that, uh, uh, that has life in it, it, that's not stemming from it. So what he's saying is, if you add these things to your Christian life, then you will not be lazy, amen, and you won't be unfruitful. You'll make a difference in your Christian life. Now I want you to notice the, uh, uh, this uh, and then we're going to get to the heart of the message. It's, it's easy for us to grab hold on the earthly perspective, right? I, I know that almost all of us have a tendency to grab hold of the earthly perspective but it is the heavenly perspective that we need and that's why he says if you lack these things you're blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sin the, be blinded means that you uh, that you have lost every semblance of your eternal perspective I want you to know you are saved by the grace of God and you should be living every day with an eternal perspective. When my wife and I were missionaries, and we were for a good long while, when we were missionaries and we were starting our deputation and just beginning uh, to do that, and by the way, deputation is hard work, and for every one of the dip, uh, missionaries that you support or you encourage who has been and has completed their deputation, you ought to give them a, a, a tremendous amount of encouragement. It is an arduous task these days to complete deputation, and if you have those that are on deputation, you need to pray for them regularly and faithfully, especially in light of the world in which we're living that don't have a thing in the world to do with this sermon but I just wanted to mention it but my wife had on her desk she worked at uh, uh, she worked at a hearing aid uh, uh, for a hearing aid company uh, uh, for an audiologist and she had on her desk a little saying and it said what have you done today that will make a difference in eternity what have you done today that will make a difference in eternity. It's really important that we live with an eternal perspective, not a temporal perspective. Now, I want to skip down now to verse number 10, and we're going to get to the heart of the message. The key here uh, is confidence, and I'm going to explain that in just a moment, but I want you to know that what you need in the Christian life is you need to have a confident Christian experience. Now that doesn't mean confidence in yourself. That doesn't mean confidence in your uh, ta 
talents or your abilities or your wit or your wisdom or anything like that. But you do need to have confidence in the reality that you are genuinely God's child and that God is going to use you according to his perfect will. And if you have confidence, you can make a difference in the kingdom of God. Without confidence, you're, gonna, you're, you're not going to be very effective at all, maybe even detrimental. I, I love sports. I, I taught, uh, I coached uh, Little League Baseball for five years and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, went to all my son's basketball games and soccer games and uh, most of his baseball games and all of that. Uh, my older son and then my younger son, I went with him all the way through his whole Little League experience and all of that. And I love sports. And the, one of the things that I learned very early on being a coach in Little League Baseball is this. That kid can do it if he believes he can do it. He can hit the ball if he really, if he has confidence. Now, if he gets up there with no confidence, he's going to, I mean, I mean, he's going to whiff every time. You can count on it. If he has no confidence that he has the ability, if he doesn't think he can catch that fly ball, then he can't catch that fly ball. But if he has confidence, he can do it. Confidence makes a huge difference in our life. Now, this is even more telling in this part. For he says in uh, verse number 10, wherefore the rather brethren, remember what we said? We said, if these things are not in you, if you don't have them, then you're barren and unfruitful. And he said, but rather, brethren, and notice he uses the word diligence again. He says, wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence. That means be totally consumed in making your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Giving diligence, being totally consumed with the Christian walk. And then he says, make the calling and election sure. Now that scares a lot of Baptists to death. It really does. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with the word calling. There's nothing wrong with the word election. And there's nothing wrong with the word predestination. And the, pro the problem is not with those words because I I've got news for you. They're in the Bible. Amen? The problem is not with the words. The problem is with the interpretation. If you yank them out of context, there's no telling what you're going to decide they mean. But if you'll leave them in the context in which they belong, they will have tremendous meaning to you. Make your calling and election sure. That's not to say we're saved by works. No, the word rather means that when we exercise faith, it expels the doubt in us and we begin to live the Christian life with confidence. Have you ever met somebody that wasn't sure they were saved? I've met people like that. I've met a lot of people like that. Not sure they're saved. Now, sometimes they, they may truly be lost. As a matter of fact, many times they are. But many times, and, and I've dealt with so many people who have doubted their salvation. And you know what I find out? I find out that they don't have any confidence. And the reason they don't have any confidence is because they've not been adding these things in their life. You know? Well, have you added to your faith? Uh... Uh, temperance and, and patience and, uh, and, and brotherly kindness and godliness. And by the way, godliness is part of it. As a matter of fact, he uses the word virtue here uh, and uh, the word virtue appears several times. I want you to get the right understanding. It is still a good idea for a Christian to live a virtuous life. Somehow we've gotten the idea that since we're children of grace and we're born of forgiveness, that we can just live any way you want to. I mean, we can just act any way, do anything, and it don't matter because we're children of grace. That is not the book. That's right. That is not the scripture. Not only is it not the scripture, but it leads to doubt. It leads to a, a sense of being unsure and unsettled. And if we'll add these things to our life, we'll strengthen our faith with confidence to live for Jesus. And that's what we really genuinely need. Rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, 29 uh, that, he, that we who are Christians have a predetermined end. And that, by the way, is what predestination is all allow all about for whom he did foreknow do you think Jesus knew what you were going to do today I believe Jesus, I believe God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit I believe they knew, they knew everything I was ever going to do all the way up to this very moment not only do I believe that I believe they know everything I'm going to do between now and, uh, and my death or the rapture 
Amen. I believe. God knows the end from the beginning. God's eternal. He's looking outside of time. No wonder he said he, that Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world when Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him uh, as righteousness. That's because as far as God was concerned, uh, the day that Abraham uh, exercised faith in God Almighty, Jesus was as good as already slain on the cross, as good as already buried in the tomb, as true as if he had already risen from the grave. My God is not bound by time. My God lives lives in an eternal existence. He lives beyond our realm. You say, I don't understand this. Me neither. Hey, my, my family does two things. They preach and they wire houses. They're electricians. That's, if you're a bore, you're going to do one of the two. There's no more options for you folks. I mean, for the moors, that's it. You say, well, what about the women? They do the same thing. They all preach. Do you know God only calls men to preach because women, it comes perfectly natural. Now, now I, I learned a lot about electricity. I learned how to wire houses. And I, I even ran some commercial jobs uh, right out of college before I, I went full-time in the ministry. So I know a lot about electricity, but for the life of me, I can't explain how it works. Benjamin Franklin can't explain how it works either. <laughs> and he discovered it. I'm, I'm telling you, it's beyond the realm of our understanding. Just because God is beyond the realm of our understanding doesn't mean that it's not so. God is greater than our understanding. He's greater than our, our ability to comprehend. God is greater. God is, hey, your God is too little if you can figure him out. If you've got it all figured out on your own and you know exactly how God does things and why God does things and when God's going to do things, i got news for you. Your God is way too small. My God's way, way, way bigger than that. Now, I want you to notice something. We're going to get to the good part here in just a minute. Hang on. Give all diligence being totally consumed. And Paul reminds us, for whom he did foreknow, he also did, be, did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Do you know what that means? That means that when you got saved, the moment you trusted Jesus, God said, you're going to be like my son. I'm going to make you like Jesus. I'm going to make you like the Lord. And you know what? One day the Bible tells, the uh, book of 1 John makes this very, very clear. We don't know what he's going to be like, but we know one thing, that when we see him, we shall be like him. I don't know what God's going to be like when he calls me out of this world, but one thing I know for sure is when I finally get to see him face to face, glory to God, hallelujah, I'm going to be like the son of the living God. I'm going to be without sin. I'm going to be without end. I'm going to be without broken. Brokenness. I'm going to be without sorrow. I'm going to be without pain. Hallelujah. He predestined me to be like that. The problem is, is most Christians, they're sitting around waiting for it to happen. Well, one of these days I'm going to be like Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Maybe you ought to think about trying to be like Jesus today. Amen. Amen. Don't, hey, don't start your sanctification process when the, when the trumpet sounds. Amen? Don't decide it's, you're going to be virtuous and live for God uh, when, the, when the Lord calls you home. That's not the time to do it. The time to do it is when you got saved so you can give him your years and your energies and your talents down here on earth. Allow yourself to be conformed to the image of his dear son. Because let me tell you something. How you live determines how you die. Amen. How you live determines how you die. The Bible, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, of 11 to 13, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Christ Jesus. 
If, now, if any man build upon that foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. <laughs> how you live determines how you die. You say, well, preacher, I ain't got to worry about that. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to glory. I, I got saved uh, 17 years ago or 37 years ago or 87 years ago. Well, I, I got saved and I know, I, I'm, I, I know, I'm, I know I'm saved. At least I, I think so. Well, my grandma told me I was. Let me tell you something. You can be saved and on your way to glory and you can doubt it every step of the way. You can stumble every day of your Christian living your experience can be far, 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 far off what God would have you to be. Not in eternity. You're going to be like Christ there, but in this life. How you live determines how you die. Listen to this. In verse 15 of the passage that we just read, it says, If any man's work shall be burned... He shall suffer a loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. If you live a life that is, that, that, that is less than productive in the kingdom of God, if you live a life with one foot trying to get right back in the world and, uh, and trying to enjoy the things of the world rather than surrendering to God, if you're constantly rebuffing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, my friend, when it comes time to die, you're going to die as a Christian, but you're going to die with regret. Do you think Lot died without regret? He lost his wife. He lost his family. And more so, he lost his testimony. He died with regret. Hey, I've seen it. Have you? Christian brother, sister. Family calls and says, please visit them. They, I know they haven't been to church in a long time, but they're really sick. And, and they made a profession years and years ago, and, and they were faithful for a while, but now is their time of death, and they're so concerned, they're so worried, and you go by and visit with them, and with tears and, and, uh, and, and great agony, they tell you how they trusted Christ uh, as a young person or as a teenager, and how they let the devil uh, get in and lead them astray, and how now they look back over their life, and they say, oh, what I could have done for my daughters, oh, what I could have done for my sons, oh, what I could have done for my family, oh, what I could have done for my community oh what I could have done for my church but I wasted it I spilled it out I used it for all of the wrong things and they're dying with great regret I do not want to die with great regret I refuse to give myself in and surrender to what Satan has for me to drag me into the point of being uh, uh, uncertain or unsettled and certainly with great regret I don't want to do that I do not want to do that. But how you live determines how you die. Some die with great reading, great regret. But now I want you to notice something else. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse 6 and 7, you know it well. I'm now, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Brother Joe, I fought a good fight. <laughs> I kept the faith. Amen. You can die with regret or you can die with confidence. You can die with assurance. You, you can die with a, uh, with, a, with, a, with a settled assurance that you might, not have, you might not have been everything that you had hoped to be, but you made every effort. You put it all on the line. You, yeah, you, you, lay, you left it all on the field. If, if, if you lost a battle, it wasn't for sake of not trying because you gave it all you had. Oh, my friend, we can die with confidence if we live for Jesus. If you live for him today and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and the day after that. My brother told me one time, he said, 
The one thing I have learned about the consistency of my Christian life is I am consistently inconsistent. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that true with most of us? We're consistently inconsistent. No, no, no. You don't have to, you don't have to die with great regret. <laughs> you, you, don't have to, you don't have to die without that confidence. But let me tell you something else. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and it's the one in between the two that we read. We read 12 and 13, and then we read 15. Let's go back and see what Paul said in verse number 14. Because Paul said in verse 14, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. You can die with victory. friend of mine and I'll finish with this a great great friend of mine his name was Emmett Wilson he was a missionary to Guatemala first time I was ever exposed to the mission field and, and I, I, I attribute uh, so much of my mission desires and, uh, and longings, the fact that I was a missionary for many years and the fact that I've stayed in missions ever since uh, even as a pastor and supported it and encouraged it is all because of Emmett Wilson. I went down to, uh, I went down to Guatemala back in uh, 1976 uh, to make concrete block after the great earthquake uh, of January of uh, 1976 1976 in Guatemala, uh, Central America, Guatemala City. And I'll never forget going to his funeral. His wife, Donna, he was, he was from uh, Tennessee Temple University. He was a member of Highland Park Baptist Church. <laughs> and he surrendered to the mission field. And oh, what a great, great missionary he was. I went and talked to Donna just before the viewing and she said you know just the other night listen to me carefully and we'll close this out just the other night said uh, he was almost blind he had diabetes very bad and uh, he had lost uh, lost part of one foot and uh, just uh, had just a lot of difficulties in his latter days of his life but Donna said she went into the living room and he was sitting in there crying and she said, Emmett, what's wrong with you? And he said this. He said, oh, Donna, if I could have just done more for Jesus, if I could have just done more for Jesus. The next day at the viewing, <laughs> or the next, yeah, I talked to her that night, and she told me that story, and the next day was the viewing. And Donna told me after the viewing was over, right before the funeral she said Gary there was literally hundreds and hundreds of people that came to me and said if it hadn't have been for Emmett I wouldn't be saved if it hadn't have been for Emmett I wouldn't be preaching the gospel if it hadn't have been for Emmett I wouldn't have, I, I, I wouldn't have surrendered uh, to the call to preach if it hadn't have been uh, for Emmett I wouldn't be a missionary serving on a foreign field today. She said one after the other, after the other, after the other. They just came pouring in, just pouring in. And every one of them said, Emmett made such a difference in my life. Paul said, there's laid up for me a crown. <laughs> you can die with victory. How are you going to live today? How are you going to live tomorrow? What's going to be on your agenda for Monday morning? What about Tuesday and Wednesday? What's important in your life? How you live today determines how you die tomorrow. How are you going to do that? Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to bring the message tonight. And Lord, I pray you'd touch our hearts with its glorious truth and draw us near unto yourself. Lord, may we commit ourselves to being used of thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. our heads bowed. I've had this song on my heart all day, and I had her play some of it this morning, Have Thine Own Way. And uh, we were recording our moments of faith a while ago at our, where we record, and I got talking about my dad. If I've ever met anybody that literally gave it all to Jesus, I'm talking holding nothing back, gave it all. 
was my dad. And he got down to where he couldn't preach, couldn't pastor, just couldn't do anything. They lived for a little while right behind the church at our other location. So he would walk over. And I came in real early one Sunday morning and he was sitting on the front row on that side, on the left side there, with his Bible and his little highlighter. He was walking through them scriptures, through his outline. I snuck up behind him. I said, hey, Dad, what are you doing? He said, I'm reminiscing. I'm reminiscing. I said, well, Dad, you're at the end of your life, your ministry. You got anything to say? Now, here's a man, to me, that was the epitome of giving it all. He said, yeah, I've got one regret. And I thought, what in the world could that be? He said, I really regret that I don't have another life to give him. And another 60 years to live for him. Somebody asked me not long ago, said, preachers who go all the time and you expend yourself, what drives you? Simply this, one day you won't be able to do it. And I don't want to say I could have. I don't want to say I should have. I want to be able to say, Lord, I did what you wanted me to do. Something's going to consume your life. Something's going to consume your body, your age, your money, your wealth, your time. Something's going to consume you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it was Christ and the work of God, something that has eternal value? I love that passage. I don't want to be blind. I don't want to be barren. I don't want to blunder. I don't want to fall. I want to stay at it. Brother Moore, your daddy just turned 90. Just turned, just turned 92. How long has your daddy been preaching? Since he was 19 years old. So whatever, 92, subtract 19. 73 giving it all giving it all don't you believe tonight the Lord is worthy of our life worthy I'll tell you what let's do tonight let's just find us a place at this altar tonight all of us Lord you're the Lord of my money you're the Lord of my time you're the Lord of my life you're the Lord of my breath you're the Lord of my body and I want to live for you tonight. Come on. Have thine own way.